All right, you get the mic again today. It's coffee time in the morning. Everybody's fed, out of their pens. The cat's driving me nuts, wants to be part of my lap. And here we are. I usually, get, I usually uh, have a few outlets I listen to current events, and if you do as well, there is no shortage of items coming up on the horizon, is there? Holy cow. The mainstream media, one of the nastiest tools ever used against humanity, isn't it? Isn't it disgusting what the mainstream media has done to us? It's unbelievable. But anyway, I'm not going to babble about that topic. Sure, if you are concerned about what really goes on in the world, you already know. Now listen to this one. This is titled, One More Memory. Hello again, Steve. Last time I wrote you, my heading was basically, This is the last time. Your comment back was, of course, If you have anything else to share, the people do it. Steve, before I get to the topic of savvy, I need a short rant. Me and my wife live on the island, Parksville. We're both in our mid-70s. Our biggest joy is still getting into our small camper unit and heading up into remote backcountry areas where we are free and alone. That brings up the subject of access. We can no longer head up into Mount Aerosmith region and spend a few nights enjoying the beauty of the lakes, etc. We can no longer travel up past Great Central Lake and access Strathcona Park, where a few years back I got to study eight stunning Sasquatch tracks in the snow. Tracks so clear they showed a two-inch canoe-shaped gouge in the rear right heel that actually packed with snow and protruded up from the track. It must have been a painful wound, and it was clear on all four of the right foot impression. Steve, with gas prices the way they are, as Delphi will be heading up to the Nimkish area that we love so much, and where I took a picture of a track in a sand pit and sent you, but such is life. Maybe I should do what the hunters used to do in the late 50s and early 60s when they were blocked by logging companies and shoot the locks off, lol. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty nasty. It's embarrassing, actually, on the island, what the vast amounts of land that is actually called private property. It's like, good God, who did that? Look out, cat. Don't even think about it. Come on, get out of here. It's, oh, my God. Hold on a second. You can't knock that over. Beat it. So you what? Sarah leaves and everybody is so needy. It's ridiculous. Uh, where was I? Sorry about that. Anyways, a share. I mentioned the past being shown a clear Polaroid photo of a Sasquatch walking through some aspen trees on a sunny day back in 76. That picture is burned into my memory as I was able to study it in detail and the image has haunted me all these years. It's the same photo I tried to get to the late Dr. John Bindernagel access to before he passed. My whole point to this letter is that I have found a clear duplicate of the head and shoulders of this being on the net. So for what it's worth, I want to share this. The Polaroid photo was the same angle as the picture attached with the following differences. Number one, it looked like the younger brother of the attached photo. Number two, the hair was shorter. I remember comparing it to a deer in color and length and thinking it might be a summer coat. I could make out a dark patch under the right arm as it swung back that looked like sweat. Number three, the thing looked to me like a seven foot teenager or early twenties with a build that looked as strong, so strong and athletic. I remember thinking there wasn't a man on this planet that it couldn't flatten with a slap. Getting this, cutting this short, is getting too long, Steve, but I promised you, man to man, this is what I saw, and this photo is identical as far as face, head shape, and the way head is low on the shoulders. I'm sure there'll be lots of comments saying it doesn't match other sightings, so be it. Maybe like us, they come in different shapes and sizes. I wish I could have shown this to Dr. John. I still remember the look of disappointment on his face when he called it Gigantopithecus, and I said, no, it looks too human. So you know there were five pictures taken of this creature, all from a tool shed that was used by a crew building a country-style road. Property is, property was the same land, the picture of the Rocky Mountains was taken that you see on Canadian money. Back in the 70s, my plumber friend Dave took several of us back there elk hunting. 
Not sure I would have slept so well on the open ground with just a sleeping bag and a ground tarp if I had seen that Polaroid first. Take care, Stephen. It looks like our camping trips will be limited to your area on Sprout L Lake, Taylor Arm, etc. So you never know, one day I might get to thank you in person for what you're doing. It's helped me unload years of frustration. Best regards, Ken Salmond. Okay, Ken, yes, you know what, uh, Taylor Arm, <clears throat> that's basically where that opening video I have, the drone going along the river, that's the Taylor River. And uh, I got I got an inflatable here, I'm going to get cleaned up here pretty quick, I'm going to start using it, and I'm going to float that entire river out to the lake, and then I'm going to get a small motor on the back and use the motor to get back all the way down the hole like the Sprout Lake. I'm going to start doing that fairly quick. But anyway, maybe we can have you in the man cave. And have you BS with the world live, possibly, soon. That is quite the photograph. I don't know. That photo looks somewhat to be of a gorilla with a human-like face put on it. I'm guessing. But that sure would be something else to see that, wouldn't it? Standing there staring you down from 9 to 10 feet tall. Right? That is quite the photograph. Well, thanks for sending that in. Be interesting if you find that Polaroid eventually one day. It's funny how the, the photos nonstop go missing, and I know of some other ones that have gone missing. Let's keep this going. I haven't checked my emails this morning yet, so I don't know if we've been contacted by our anticipated shares coming up or not yet. Unexplained experience. One evening, my son returned home late in the evening. As we exited our vehicle, we were jokingly talking about Sasquatch. My son made a sound loudly that he thought Sasquatch would make, and to our surprise, we got a reply and a tree knock. That was followed by the sound of something moving through the brush in our direction rapidly. We hurried into the house, did not turn on the lights, and stayed away from the windows. We soon heard very heavy footsteps circling the house for about three minutes. Soon quiet returned, and we retired for the evening. The following day, I took a large... Sorry. The following day... I looked at a large footprint on the concrete driveway. The preceding evening had been rainy, and there was a large footprint-shaped wet impression on the concrete. It was about 14 inches long and about 6 or 7 inches wide. I took a picture with my phone. This was several years and phones ago, but I'm not sure if the picture is still in my electronic storage. I had forgotten all about this experience until recently. I wanted to share, although this is not ex Although this is not as exciting as many of your other stories. Stay safe. That's okay, man. It's not about, uh, there's definitely no competition here. It's about listening to you and everybody else. That's all it's about. Get it out, share it, and we're going to learn from it. Well, the coffee's good this morning. <clears throat> anyway, Mark, uh, I'd be curious to know if that's it. I mean, if that's it, the whole property went blank on any more uh, action around there if so good for you but yeah it's funny man I do I my personally I do not make sounds to attract these people in the woods obviously if you can tell by like yesterday's video the places I go and majority of the time I'm alone why would I bring want to try to bring that upon myself right it's like just leave me alone let me enjoy this and you guys stay wherever you're staying and enjoy it too Here we go. This is titled Questions Answered from My Story. Steve, after a while not hearing my story, I figured it was lost, and I sent it again. Please disregard. The amount of emails is way more than I thought. Also, I apologize for the typos in the email. It was late, and I was tired when I sent it in. And now that you read it today, I see how confusing the collision was and how I wasn't correct on how it went. The creature slammed into my truck just before the driver's rear tire. I'm pretty sure it put its hands out to either flip my truck over or brace itself for impact at my driver's door. That's when it was at my window, and I saw it so close and well. The handprint slid down to the truck bed, where it slammed into the truck and made the dent. Some part of it went under the driver's rear tire. I originally s said passenger tire, but that was incorrect. I'm not sure what part went under the tire, but it popped the back of the truck got pretty high, almost causing me to wreck. So it hit the truck, went under the driver's rear tire, and apparently ran off. I could have dragged it, and its head or a limb flew up, making the dent before it went 
or part of it went under the tire. There is a lot of blood dried on the rims and tires. Now that I'm thinking about it, I could have dragged it away as not knowing and been dead on up and been dead on up the road in a ditch. As an adult now, I would have done things differently for sure. And knowing these creatures exist does not keep me away from the dark or the woods. If I have any future encounters, I know what to do now thanks to this channel. Another part didn't make sense in it in the story when you read it is when you read it was the start stop crap I was referring to when they parallel you in the woods and walk when you walk stop and when you walk it was, sorry <laughs> I got a reflection here I got to reposition this I was referring to when they parallel you in the woods and walk when you walk and stop when you stop only to make you think you're just hearing things I have one stand where that happens almost every time you walk out in the dark. Oh, that sucks. But I always thought it was my imagination until I found this channel. Deer season, deer season will be here in Alabama, and I'm curious for this to happen now that I've heard all these stories. I'll be more cautious and pay more attention to it. Leave the location private. I live on the Tuscaloosa slash Green County line. Oh, no way. Been there dozens and dozens and dozens of times. If you're back this way, give me a shout. Plenty of turkey and whitetail on our land. You don't have to share this. It's up to you. I just wanted to clear that up. Thanks again, Steve, and sorry for the confusion. Roll Tide. Roll Tide, man. I love it where you are. Love it down there. You know, actually, uh, when he, we had all hell broke, breaking loose here a month ago with our, our uh, fascist so-called leader, I was basically making phone calls and preparations to get out of here across the border, and that was where I was going, Green County. We'll see what happens. Thanks for sending that in, man. I remember the story well. All right, what's this one called? This is titled Bigfoot. took a while to figure out your address. Real life comes by thinking for yourself. God bless Josie. All right. That must be a typo because it says, Hi, Mike. <laughs> my name is Giselle. This is my encounter. When I was 14, my dad bought me a 243 to hunt deer with him. His friends assured him. His friends assured him he wasted his money. But what he got was a whole lot of memories with his daughter. Good for you. Our last hunt together was also a moose hunt. He was 72. Dad drew a moose tag up around Bondurant, Wyoming. Mom, Dad, and I went on an adventure. I was around 32 at the time. We got to our chosen spot early opening morning. Headed up the mountain along the ridge and weren't being all that quiet. He was a jokester. I was a few steps ahead of him laughing, and there's a bull moose about 35 yards. And I say moose and duck out behind him. He didn't believe me at first, but he dropped the moose and the work started. Not far from where we parked, still there was no way he and I could drag that beast. He asked if I wanted to get the quad back at camp. No, I have an elk tag and it's early. So off he went. I headed to a different ridge to get away from the wafting smell of blood going up the mountain. I was two ridges over and this, and this need to go back came over me. So I turned around. I get to where the carcass lays and there's a crashing coming through the deadfall on the other side. I slid in behind a fallen tree and watched. No more crashing. So I let out a chirp. I got a chirp back. Oh, I'm a lucky girl. And I wait, and I wait. Nothing's moving. All is silent. I turn to go up and bolt, and a bolt of swift movement down the draw into the timber below. Shit, a bear. Well, game on. I wasn't going to I wasn't going to hand the winter meat over. Wait, bears don't chirp. They don't hide. And wow, that heavy pungent odor was horrific. I started pacing, hoping the movement would help. It was 20 minutes or more before I heard the quad fire up. It left the same way it came, just as quick and just out of sight. I was fine telling my dad my story. Then he says, good thing I heard or he would have drug you off. There was no stop in the tears or fear after that, and we got our asses out of there. Easiest and fastest load we ever did. I backed the truck up to the incline. We rolled the moose in 
then the quad. With Miles behind us, I opened us both a beer. Thanks for hurrying, Dad. Wow. Um, all right, just the fact that you said there was cheers and crying, um, it was more of an intense experience than you possibly put in a text here. And you're lucky you didn't lose that moose. That would have sucked getting a draw in Wyoming. I don't imagine that's too common. And then coming back and your moose is taken away, I would be on fire. On fire. Huh. That's great that you got to go with your dad. And I'm sure you love that moose meat. It sure is good and good for you, isn't it? Oh, and that noise in the video yesterday was actually opening was a big bull moose fight. Actually, I'm going to put it in the head of this video, I hope to remember to. I don't know what happened, why it couldn't, why it didn't show, but I'll fix that up in a bit here. Thanks for sending that email in again. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. This is titled, I Need Some Encouragement and Advice. Dear Steve, thank you for reading. Before I start, I'd like to get something off my chest. Your rants are anything but rants, but are packed with wisdom. The wisdom of a guy who lives in the real world. Keep them coming, Steve. You take on the bullshit going on in this world is spot on. So, as you'd say, let her rip. Also, I just wanted to mention that your intro and outro music is fantastic. As a former touring musician, I think I can say that with confidence. I particularly like the dance club rave arpigated keyboard piece and the dramatic staccato piece with the piano intro and the strings great stuff keep using it you know what i would keep using it but i can't unfortunately i bought that from pond five years back and then all of a sudden something happened on youtube and they gonged all of my videos with that sound bit in it and it's a big hassle so i can't use it anymore weird isn't it i'll be brief now that I'm pushing 61 my old rough camping buddies are losing a step but although I'm small and built like a 35-year-old and have the energy to match, I haven't been able to get them out much. So starting last year, I began to go to my favorite forest camp and trout stream spot solo. I won't be specific about its location, it's my secret, and too beautiful to let out. I know you understand. I'll just give a general location in the event it'll be helpful to your viewers. It's located in north-central Wisconsin. The most incredible forest and little trout stream you've ever seen. Last year on my Last solo camp of the season, I had an experience that left me disturbed. The time was late July. After my great day of fishing, I enjoyed some trout and just sat around the fire. But I had this odd feeling. Something was watching me. I'd never experienced this before, and I'd been in those woods for the better part of 30 years. I tried to shake it off, enjoyed a beer and the fire for a couple of hours, and went to bed. About 3 a.m. or so, I awoke. Something was circling my camp not far from my tent. Like a dumbass, I wasn't armed. Never even thought about it because the, the feeling of being watched in the evening, I brought my hatchet and a machete I carry into the tent and kept it next to me. I lay and listened. It definitely sounded like something on two legs, bipedal. I wasn't terrified, but I admit I was scared shitless. <laughs> wasn't terrified, but scared shitless. <laughs> it continued circling for a few minutes or so, but I was so exhausted from a day in the stream that I eventually fell asleep. I woke the next morning with no incidents. Flash forward to last week, the week of August 17th. I couldn't convince my buddy to go, so I drove the 400 miles from Minneapolis to Green Bay and up to my spot in the forest. It's about a mile in on very rough fire lane off a small county road. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was overjoyed to be there, but must admit I was a bit of sketched out as I entered the forest, backpack on and rods in hand for my hike to the stream. I've been watching all your videos, and the stories certainly gave me pause. But I had lined my reel with some new lemon green fly line, and I couldn't wait to try it. I walked down a steep ravine through the forest, a path, and old game trail I've known and used for years. My head, however, was on a swivel. Steve, my, one of my best fishing buddies gave up rough camping in the forest, I had two choices. Man up, go alone, or give up my passion. Like you, I love it too much, and I won't quit. After a short hike, I reached the stream, sat on a stump, and excitedly rigged my fly rod, and waded into the stream. I fished for a few hours, and had an amazing time. And managed to land one of the three nice brookies I had on the line. 
but the whole time I felt incredibly uneasy, my head on a swivel. I'd gotten much further downstream than I'd planned to go when it happened. There was a loud crack, followed by something, a large tree limb, I believe, that was thrown into the stream about 30 yards ahead on the left bank. This is a forest stream, and the timber is thick, right to the stream's edge. I heard something crashing in the thick underbrush, and when I looked up, saw brush and trees and saplings moving where the branch was thrown into the water. Whatever it was, was large. I never got a look at it, but by the sound of the crashing through the brush and the amount of brush and trees swaying as it moved, it was huge. It scared the hell out of me. Now, I understand that feeling of sheer dread, absolute terror. I saw the vegetation moving for only a few split seconds, and then absolute silence. It either disappeared, or was sitting stock still where it was. I'm drinking coffee too right now, you guys. I thought, oh shit, and quietly and quickly waded to the right bank of the stream, and climbed out as quietly as possible. I stood motionless and looked at the spot of the movement, thinking, bear, nothing. I listened, nothing, but I knew it was there. I was petrified and a long way from getting out of that forest and to my car. Steve, I thought I was only 30 yards from the deep hole I'd been thinking about fishing all week. I took your advice. Yes, this happened right at the spot where I had been on quite a few trout the last time I was out. I turned and headed back where I came from. What took me hours to fish, what took me hours to fish, I covered 20 minutes. I think that probably meant what took me hours to hike, I covered in 20 minutes. I was shaking and breathless the entire time, looking behind me much more than where I was going as I fought through the tangle of brush and trees. I eventually made it back to that stump, tore down my rods, and made the hasty hike back up the ravine to my auto. Here's the kicker. On the trailhead exiting the forest, smack in the middle of the trail, laying diagonally, was a thick, perfectly broken stick, about four feet long and three inches in diameter. It wasn't there when I entered the forest a few hours earlier. I haven't been that scared in a long time, if ever. Steve, I need some encouragement. I love trout fishing and sleeping in the forest, and have since I was in my 20s, but I'm feeling like a coward. I don't know how I'll get up the stones to go back, but I have to. I refuse to be a coward. Next time I go, I'll be carrying a 10 mil pistol, but I know that fear will be with me. Wish me luck, friend. Any advice you can give would be greatly appreciated. I respect your instincts. You're most welcome to use my name. Best to you and yours, and watch your six. Mark John Kasparek. <clears throat> All right, Mark. First off, uh, you probably heard and read of all of us talking about this. And as long as you're hearing noises, hearing branches being broke, feeling like you're being followed. Okay, well, let me restart that. As long as you're feeling the presence or hearing the noises, you're probably okay, is my guess. And that seems to be what we're hearing straight across the board from all the emails, right? Everybody's hearing the same things, possibly seeing the same things, feeling the same things, but nobody's dying. But then again, people who have died aren't emailing, obviously. But for me, if you're hearing noise, intentional noise, you're, you're probably going to be safe. Um, I have a feeling the absolute dead silence and, and nothing else but dead silence. I think that is probably the nature's number one vital warning, as far as I'm concerned. Dead silence. You're not hearing nothing. You start looking around. And you start to get your ass out of there. But I'm like you. I'm not going to stop, obviously. I mean, I don't know if you guys heard me yesterday, but... I'm about to drive for two days straight, straight up the length of the province, and I'm going to go dive into some a huge patch of timber and around a remote lake that's never been logged, and i got to try to hike into that water somehow. Anyway, um, and I'm going to go do that solo, and I'm going to bring a bunch of salt and cameras, and I want to see what's running around there and start prepping now for next fall. And then the next time I go back up will be in September for elk, I'll check all those cameras. Be the way what I'm saying is, I'm not quitting. I don't even have any friends that would go that distance. I don't have any hunting or fishing partners, hunting partners that would go that distance 
with me right now just to do that. I don't know that many people that are that avid, but we're in my immediate circle of friends. But uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not looking forward to the day I can't hike anymore, but I have a feeling I'm probably going to die out there doing it anyway. So I'd rather I'd prefer to die that way. So I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to quit. And if I, well, I can share with you, if you feel nervous, you just speak out loud, say your piece, tell it you don't want anything to do with them for them to leave you alone and go fishing. And if they still feel adamant, they just don't like you, they're going to let you know it and they're going to let you safely leave again. But more than likely, you're going to be scared absolute shitless again when they tell you to get out of here again. So it's all up between, it's, it's up to you and what's between your ears, how you're going to work it, right, Mark? You're going to either go, uh, I can't do this, I'm not going. Or you're going to push yourself to do it, say your piece out loud to them, and tunnel vision focus on catching that huge trout and camping and having a good time. And if they are adamant, adamant they don't want you to, well, like, unfortunately, they're going to win. But at least you're going to be alive, right? And then you can go scouting and find another beautiful place. That's what I did the last two years. Is these new places I found is was from me traveling the province by myself, looking for a new area I've never been to, untouched, and nobody knows about. And I found it. So you can do that too, right? The adventure is always there, no matter what. It's not always about that one spot. There's new adventure everywhere. So you're right. Don't quit, Mark. All right? And if you do go back there, you did, let us know how it went. All right? Good luck. do we have here all right this is titled Amer Native American story well Steve please don't, please don't say my email or anything my name is well just call me Mark I live in southern Missouri I don't have any crazy Bigfoot stories not like I hear on your channel I do have something I think you would like to hear I am three-quarter Cherokee give or take I grew up in the middle of nowhere on a small farm with my grandparents. Anyways, I've always had dreams, visions, would know things were going to happen. Now, there are people out there that won't believe me or what I say, and that's okay. That's on them, not me. Me as a native, I grew up believing the traditions of the Cherokee. Always have, always will. Now, there are some creatures we believe in, or I do with all my heart. The woods and timber are full of many unknowns. Now, anyway... We had some property across the county road from my house. After school, I would take my single shot 20 gauge and shoot squirrels. I got out of school one day and went hunting. It was about five. I w it was about five, and the sun was about to go down. I had a few squirrels, and I never wanted to be up in the hills in the dark, so I had about a 15 minute walk back to the road. So I started to walk back. As it started to get darker, I started to get nervous. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. There's a big walnut tree I used as a landmark when I walked up on it. I knew I was about seven yards from the road. Anyways, I saw it in the distance. It was almost dark, and I was walking fast trying to get home. I saw the tree about 50 yards away, and I noticed a shadow up in the tree. I slowed down. A voice in my head said, keep walking. Don't stop. Don't look at it. Ignore it. So I kept walking, following my normal walking trail to get home. I walked past the tree, and right when I passed the tree, I heard a big limb snap and shatter, and then it hit the forest floor. I jumped and turned around, pointing my little H&R 20 gauge in that direction. All I saw was a 15-inch rotting limb that fell and was busted up on the ground. I turned around laughing at myself, and there it was, a shotgun distance. Eight to nine foot tall, muscular, still kind of skinny though, standing there looking at me. It didn't make a noise. I was, always told, I was always told to stand my ground, make noise and look big, don't run. Not sure why, but I started to talk to it, saying, You can't hurt me, I have power over you. I started to pray in Cherokee out loud, basically saying, Great protector, protect, great creator, protect me. Make this evil being afraid of your power. Get me home. I kept praying and I started to walk, walking closer to it. I walked right past it, and it started to walk behind me, and I stopped. I turned around and dropped my squirrels on the ground in between us and said, Even trade? 
as I pushed the squirrels closer to it with the gun barrel. As I started to back away, with the snap of a finger, I grabbed the squirrels and took off up the hill, and I ran home. I told my grandpa, and he said the next time I'm up there after dark to leave a squirrel by that big walnut as a trade. He went as far as making a hook for me to hang on. Since that day, I would leave it. Since that day, I would leave a squirrel on the tree, even if it was my only one. And I would walk back to the road. And I shit you not, by the time I got to the road, there would always be a fresh squirrel tail in my path right before I got to the road. I guess it was saying thank you. It's been 10 years since I hunted that spot after we moved, but I think I was feeding the devil himself. Thank you for letting me get this out there. Thank you for everything you do. Feel free to email me, Mark. Wow. It's pretty intense, man. Who's got the balls to walk right up to one and pass one? Seriously, <laughs> holy shit. It was funny about the, the, the trees getting pushed down on trails and branches and stuff. Um, I don't think I say it enough, but... I always, I'm going remote by myself, either with a truck or on my quad. I pack, a I pack a chainsaw with a full tank every time, right? I don't need to be remote and have a great big tree thump down behind me, and then you're indefinitely stuck. And typically where I go is going to take me a day or two to walk out. No thanks. So anyways, you guys, make sure you bring a chainsaw with you, all right? Just for those times, and somebody might want to mess with your ass and drop a huge tree behind and in front of you, which has happened in the past. Many people. Thanks for that story, man. That's amazing. You keep them coming. All right, here we go. One more. This is titled Tell My Story. Hi there. Not sure if this is the email to submit our encounters to you or not, but it's the only one I could find. My name is John. The area that it's occurred on is the outside edge suburbs of Nampa, Idaho. There's quite a bit of farmland between the suburbs and open desert brush country on the other side. Not far from our house was an artesian spring, artesian spring that created several small ponds that people regularly fished in. The event happened in the late evening in the springtime. My wife and I were in bed watching TV with the window open, but the blinds partially closed. We both heard footsteps walk across the gravel between our window and the lawn. There's a canal access road behind the property, so my assumption was we had a prowler. I grabbed the pistol and flashlight and went to find whoever it was. When I first went out, there was no sign of anyone around. I started walking around the house by the side lawn and still didn't see anything on our property or the pasture next door. Suddenly, I heard and felt footsteps excuse me, running towards me from behind. The vibrations from the footfalls were as strong as when a horse runs past you. My first thought was, shit, this is a big dude. I won't lie, it took all my discipline to turn around and face it. I've been in the military, AFSOC, and I think that training, that training kept me from freezing or hesitating. I turned, had my weapon raised and finger on the trigger, fully expecting to be attacked. I thought I might get one shot before it happened, but nothing was there. I scanned everywhere with the flashlight, but nothing was anywhere. I couldn't understand it. That thing was practically right on top of me. To this day, I can't figure out why I hadn't fired. I'm grateful I didn't, but still surprised. I checked around the rest of the house several more times, changing up my direction, and even sat and waited for a while, but never saw anything. I have no idea what it was, but it was definitely bipedal and heavy. This was the only encounter... I had like this, but I should add that this house had other issues of unexplainable sort. Hearing and seeing weird things. Movement out of your peripheral vision sort of things. Not sure what it was, but I'll never forget it. I really enjoy your channel and your perspective on the subject you talk about. Thanks for listening, John. Thanks for sharing, John. And uh, if, you've, if you've heard enough of the people here, you know that uh, you're not the only one to have experienced that, right? And it's a very weird thing. Even like one, the one memory when you just mentioned that comes up to me was, remember the guy in the tree stand? He said he's sitting in the tree stand in the dark and something freaking spat a great big gob in the back of his neck. Never saw it. How, how do you even go back in the woods after something like that? Or even outside when it's dark? 
Isn't that crazy? And isn't it funny how, how most of us say, I would go there alone. Well, what's, what, in, in reality, in common sense, what difference is it going to make if you have somebody with you? It's not, right? But isn't it funny how the human herd, and I'm not saying that being insulting, but we are a herd animal. We are probably, humans are possibly the most insecure herd animal on the face of the planet. We have to live by each other. We have to survive with each other. We don't like going, your average human doesn't like going air by itself, you know? Anyway, I gotta get through another one and go find me another coffee and get this day going. This is early in the morning, by the way. What else do we got? So many. There's so freaking many. Okay, one more. Oh, not this one. This one will take a week. Sorry. I'll get to save that another time. And when I when I get this far into a video and then I come across that a video that's way too long, it's not gonna get read. Not enough time. How about this one? Oh, there's another monster one too. Holy cow. How about this one? <laughs> Alright, this one's not too bad. Here we go. Uh, Mark, this is Brad. <clears throat> this is titled Man, Bear, Pig. Hello, Steve. I hope this is the right place to send this stuff. I grew up in the middle of the Appalachian Mountains in northern Pennsylvania. I spent years in the woods, stump jumping, hiking, camping, and raising hell from time to time. It's a place where you can go four-wheeling with thousands of trails to blaze with flat mountain tops and lots of places to explore. My first experience of fear was four-wheeling at dusk when the light of the four-wheeler hit something. I slammed on the brakes because it was in the middle of the trail, six feet tall, swaying to and fro. I peed a little. I realized I was letting out a high-pitched, E. Oh, hell no, I said. Hammered the gas, and off the trail I flew. I don't know how fast I was going, but I blew its doors off. Found a trail that connected me back to the main trail, made it home an hour later. I didn't know how to deal with what happened. I went to the bar to have a beer and reflect. I saw a friend at the pub, and I asked, Are Sasquatch real? And he looked at me and smiled, and chuckled a little bit. I said, You saw Stubby, didn't you? He said, Stubby? I don't know. I told him where I was riding, and he said, Yep, it's a bear that got hit by a car head-on, smashed its face, messed up its front legs. It walks on two legs a lot, huffing a long, huge, huge of relief. Man, I don't know what the hell I saw, but it freaked me out. I never saw it again out for a wheeling. I've heard others telling stories of this man-bear-pig thing named Stubby. Whether or not it was a Sasquatch or a messed-up bear, I don't know. Years later, I moved to West Virginia and saw eyes in the woods when pulling into my driveway, thinking it was my cat. A call for him to my left, my cat meowed. Um, okay, if you're here, then who's that in the woods? Pulling out my old light, I shined the light towards the woods and I saw the eyes again. Then they stood up. It was tall, really tall, black and huge found myself making that same high-pitched E sound, followed by hurried flip-flops that tried to haul ass inside. It was a nope, not today kind of moment. I don't know. Not going to check either. Not going to go check either. The next day I checked. No prints. Nothing. Thanks for letting me share. Watch your six, Mike. Yeah, you watch yours too, Mike. Thanks for sharing that. And we all know that Black bears don't get hit by cars, get their snouts punched into the back of their skull, mess up their front legs, and walk around on their hind, <laughs> hind legs. They just don't. Sorry to be the bear of bad news to those who may have uh, believed it. All right, let's go one more here. One more. Let's see if we got another slurp of coffee here. All right. This is titled Sasquatchawan. Hi, Steve. My name is Gerald. I'm a Salto Cree from southern Saskatchewan. I've had one sighting of this guy, see the drawing attached, but I feel like he is with me or around me often. I live in the bush. My nearest neighbor is 400 yards, and it's impossible to see their house in the summer. It was a beautiful day. I was about 12 years old, alone on my bike, two kilometers from home. I stopped because I had a feeling I needed to investigate a noise. I walked up a little hill so I could see over the other side. 
on the power line clearing some two to three hundred yards away was this guy. I thought it was a bear at first. It was crouched down really low, then it stood up. My jaw dropped, my heart skipped a few beats, and I was frozen for a second. Then it waved in a gesture that felt like he knew me. Then I sensed the word friend, like he was reminding me we know each other. I had three near-death experiences in the past, and I think he had something to do with me still being alive. Not sure how, but I have this feeling, you know. Anyways, my curiosity turned into fear, and I booked it home. My buck never went so fast, ever, or since, lol. I've never seen him since, but I feel like he protects me when I need it. Steve, I really enjoy hearing all the shares. In my search for truth and knowledge, I ended up here. And don't feel the need to search anymore. I feel like I found what I was really searching for. Your community. I'm going to change that to our community. <laughs> Is where I have the same feeling of comfort in belonging as my home did a long time ago. I'm 50 now, and I remember it clearly. I also used to have really vivid dreams that would play out in real life. Exact, exactly, even smells like deja vu, but intense, like watching a real-life playback. How does that happen? Is that time travel? Thank you so much, Steve. You don't realize how important this belonging feels when the media has us feeling beaten and battered. You keep me swinging in this good fight. Love and respect brother and same back at you man thank you so much for that share the kind words to everybody here in your picture and i will remember that's what i don't do i forgot to do the other day is copying these to my phone and then loading into the dropbox so i can get them on the other program anyway uh that's it for right now um i gotta get my butt going you know, share my story at howtohunt.com. All right, you guys, so many people, um, so many people have a tough time finding that. I think I've been putting it in the descriptions below. Um, but I gotta go, gotta go, to go on a bit of a road trip to get some more gates for the barn, for the horses, so I can get out of this freaking tsunami waterfall outside, and then, uh, Get this barn done, and then I head back to the coastal interior mountains of British Columbia right away. Get my other trail cameras, make some videos, snoop around, and uh, get my horse trailer and a bunch more hay. Come back, and then get ready to leave again for the north. So that's it for right now, you guys. Be safe, and I'm going to have a challenge coming up soon. I'm going to challenge everybody to possibly see who wants to go we'll start sm start small who wants to join me in one week of absolute no internet one week of absolute no sugar and no one week of absolute no bread who's in and then you get to see what the difference is in the end of the week but the no internet is going to be very interesting i think i'm blocked out of facebook now i mean i don't i don't flip through facebook i use that just to contact people i guess i should probably I got some pages on there with up to 30, 40,000 people on it for hunting. I guess I probably should get back on there, but yeah, I don't go on Facebook. Uh, Instagram sometimes posts on there and it automatically posts to Facebook, but I, I'm really tapering away from a lot of social media and I find it's not having that bad of an effect on my mind. And um, I'm thinking maybe we should get everybody to take just a week. A week away from the bullshit to give your mind more healthy things to focus on. No sugar, no bread. Just because I've done that numerous times and I want as many people out there to just give it a go and see how you feel at the end of it and how much you weigh. And then, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I hope I can encourage, if I could do anything in this lifetime right now, besides this, it would be to see how many people I could get to absolutely axe, chop all mainstream news, all of it. Chop it off, lop the head right off of it and bury it. The There's some evil, evil, evil characters in the world today doing some nasty ass shit to us. And the only way they can do it is by using the tool, the weapon, called mainstream news that's the only way they can do it to us 
we got to learn how to take it away. We can start by chopping the head off mainstream news right off the bat, right? All right, this copy is really starting to kick in. I'm going to go downstairs, grab another one, and do some editing, and then I'm out of here. I'll be back.